Hello and welcome to The Wide Angle. I'm Brendan Fallon. June 3rd will mark the 100th day of the Russia-Ukraine war. It's been 100 days since the Russian forces began the invasion of Ukraine. After their failed seizure of Kiev, Russian forces are regrouping and focusing their offensive on eastern Ukraine. Today I'm joined by former U.S. Marine Corps Captain Elliot Ackerman, who sheds light on the deeper aspects of this conflict and on what we could see unfold in the near future. Ackerman led a platoon of Marines in Fallujah in 2004 during what's widely considered the highest point of conflict during the Iraq War. In the course of his Iraq and Afghanistan service, he received the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor, and the Purple Heart. Before we start, to see the full 20-minute plus version of this video, you can join Epoch TV, a streaming service committed to fact-based journalism and other quality content. Elliot, it's fantastic to have you back on the show again. Yeah, thanks for having me. In terms of Russia, Ukraine, you've recently written some articles for The Atlantic about the situation there. It's, I think, June 3rd marks the 100th day since um, Putin went into Ukraine. I think Western analysts in the beginning, they, were, they had this expectation this was going to be over pretty fast. I think the, the term shock and awe attack was mentioned. I've seen a kind of, from my basic observation, a, a kind of to and fro where sometimes Ukraine seems to be doing well, then later it's Russia that's, that's getting ahead. More recently, uh, Russia has taken Mariupol and has taken the, the eastern coast of Ukraine. I'm interested to know your take on the, the current status quo there. Well, I mean, a famous military axiom is that no plan survives first contact. So clearly the Russian plan didn't survive first contact. Um, seeing uh, how things have unrolled over the last 100 days, you know, it would certainly appear that the Russians underestimated the significance of the Ukrainian resolve. Mm -hmm. uh, they underestimated or at least didn't appreciate how since their invasion of Crimea in 2014, a real resentment had been building uh, among the Ukrainian people. And that's not just the Ukrainians in the West, but also Ukrainians uh, in the East and the, in the territories that Russia is contesting. So they were not greeted as liberators, uh, which in some ways, a lot of their strategy was predicated on the fact that they would be able to manipulate divisions that existed within Ukraine. Um, so I think that's why we haven't seen a collapse uh, of Ukraine that at least it would seem the Russians uh, had gambled on. But once the facts on the ground show that there would be stiff Ukrainian resistance, the Russians have shown the ability to adapt. You know, they've pulled back their forces from around Kyiv. They've focused on fighting in the east around the Donbass. And it seems now the war has entered into a phase that's uh, really more of a war of attrition, less grand maneuvers, but more really two now increasingly well-armed sides just grinding it out between one another. Right. You mentioned how the Ukrainians' receptivity, I guess, to, to Russia coming in as a, almost a kind of savior, how that factored in heavily. Is that, would, would you say that's the main factor in Russia's um, failures so far? It's always important to keep in the foremost of thought the fact that, you know, as Clausewitz said, you know, war is politics by other means. So you can never lose sight of that, no, no matter what side that you are on. So people, you know, the Russians are using warfare to gain a political objective. And their political objective was the annexation of you know, all of Ukraine, perhaps, but now at least part of Ukraine into the Russian Federation. Um, but because it's a political aim, the politics on the ground really matter. And since the Russian invasion of 2014, you know, the political topography of Ukraine has changed. If you look at polling, Ukrainian sentiments towards Russia has you know, somewhat obviously uh, turned very, very negative. So then when Russia invades in 2022, they're, in, they're moving into a very difficult political environment than they were looking at, let's say, eight years ago. And so the resistance they're meeting is really the manifestation of that political environment. And so, you know, when we talk, when we look at the early days of the invasion and what you know, many watchers were anticipating, which was this Russian invasion force of 200,000. How will the Ukrainian military that's several orders of magnitude smaller stand up against them? Well, that math wasn't really correct because you saw a very united Ukraine meeting this invasion force. And Ukraine is a nation of 40 million people. So when you flip those numbers around, an invasion force of 200,000 up against a population of 40 million, suddenly you see that there is an advantage that Ukrainians have. But again, the Russians have shown an ability to adapt, to modify their plan. Uh, and now we're seeing the war entering another stage uh, in the Donbass, that is much more a war of attrition. 
Elliot, you were a, a Marine captain. You fought in the Iraq War. You were in uh, Fallujah, which is described as one of the, the hottest um, points of that conflict. Based on your, your on-the-ground experience, what do you infer the situation? Do you draw from that any inference about what the f fighters are dealing with on either side, Russia, Ukraine, on, in this kind of urban warfare situation? Mm. I would say early on, because, you know, I've been covering the war, that when you go to, for instance, a city like Kyiv that pre-war had a population of around 4 million people, mm -hmm. and you look at the prospect of Russian troops fighting it out in Kyiv, uh, you know, if you've ever fought in a city, you realize what an incredibly daunting prospect that was. I mean, as you mentioned, I fought in the Fallujah battle, and we were about 10,000 Marines, uh, and we had to take that city from members of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And uh, that was a city of around pre-war pre half a million people, but not nearly as developed as Kyiv, uh, not nearly as complex in terms of its topography. Mm -hmm. You know, that took us more than a month of very intense house-to-house -house fighting to do that. So when you looked at some of the Russian objectives early on, you realized like, this is wildly optimistic that if, you know, as, so long as the population doesn't uh, cave in, and as long as there is real resistance, there's no way the Russians are gonna be able to do this. But you know, now, again, that the war has migrated down into the east, I would say the biggest lesson I take away from that is, you know, obviously, at the end of the day, you know, war is relatively simple. It's the contest of human wills. Uh, and so long as each side is appropriately equipped, armed, as long as it has resources in terms of blood and treasure, it's really who has the longest will to, to grind it out in this conflict and continue fighting. Your next book that's due to be published in August, it's called The Fifth Act. And my understanding is that it's tying together the events starting from September 11th, the terrorist attack, to the catastrophic withdrawal of the U.S. troops from Afghanistan. That was last year, August. Do you see um, anything to draw from that in terms of Russia-Ukraine? Do you see there's uh, any relationship between the, what you take from that experience, that, that 20 years of, of war, in terms of the, the foreign policy stance that's been taken by America that relates to Russia-Ukraine? Absolutely. The book, I mean, the book is called The Fifth Act, America's End in Afghanistan, because tragedies in classic dramatic structures are typically told mm -hmm. in five acts. And so, you know, when we look at what happened last summer in August of 2021, when the U.S., well, NATO, withdrew from Afghanistan, it was a catastrophic withdrawal. Uh, it showed a real lack of competence on everyone's part to do it in a, to do the withdrawal in an orderly fashion. Mm -hmm. And you know we have to assume that that summer, uh, Vladimir Putin was weighing whether or not he was going to make his move in Ukraine. And when he saw the capabilities of the NATO alliance in Afghanistan, uh, obviously it would lead him to believe that the the alliance was fractious, you know, didn't have a great ability to hold together, didn't have an ability to perform competently, and that really the will to fight another war didn't exist. And so as much as Putin's calculus was sort of gambling on the fact that he wouldn't meet stiff Ukrainian resistance and that the Ukrainians would sort of fall apart as a people into a Ukrainian and a pro-Russian camp, he was also banking on the fact that the NATO alliance wouldn't hold together. And he had what seemed like very clear proof of that in our disastrous withdrawal in Afghanistan.